All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome all to week three, the embayment session of the Nearshore Restoration Summit and Synthesis. We are so glad to have you here. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered together but apart on Coast Salish ancestral homelands. I am speaking from Olympia, Washington, which occupies the traditional territories of the Squaxin, Nisqually, and Cowlitz peoples whose ancestors resided here from time immemorial and who still thrive today. We respect and uphold the Coast Salish peoples and sovereign tribal nations as knowing bodies and defining partners in our effort to improve the integrity and resilience of ecosystem processes that support environmental and human health and well-being. Welcome everyone, take two. Uh, and thanks for your patience uh, for, um, as, we, as we navigate our technology. So as we gather in this virtual space, I would like to orient you to our Zoom rules of the road for the summit. First, settle in, enjoy yourself. Be glad that the te technology issues are happening to us and not you. <laughs> um, this is uh, a really great uh, um, set of speakers that we have today and um, we're really excited um, to have everybody here. So enjoy yourself. Give yourself permission as you are able to unplug for other things. Give yourself that gift of closing your email and um, uh, silencing your phone and really um, being in a, in a space where you can engage as much as possible with, with the content of the talks. Um, if you are having a technical issue or have a question for a summit organizer, um, you can use the chat function in Zoom for that. Um, panelists will, will use the chat function to ask questions of the speakers. Please write to whom your question is addressed. If you have a question for a speaker um, and you are an attendee, please use the Q&A function and, um, and always write the speaker's name to, um, to who the question is addressed. Speakers, um, please feel free to answer in writing any questions um, that we don't have time to answer live. And we will be monitoring our team, uh, the Q&A and the chat. Um, and we will also be building in space for, for questions and answers after each talk. Speakers, please mute yourselves um, and have your video turned off when you're not speaking. And I, as your moderator, will unmute and say two minutes left very kindly but firmly um, at 10 minutes into your talk. And uh, at 12 minutes, I will unmute and play a beeping alarm. Um, and I will turn my video on and, um, and really encourage you at that point to, to wrap up the talk so that we have time for some questions and for a question and answer. We will have a break in which attendees and speakers can informally interact and we call this the Wonder Lounge. And, uh, and this is a way for, um, for everyone to interact with one another, ask questions uh, that is not um, orchestrated or facilitated in any way by um, us, the summit organizers. Um, We've invited a group of scientists and practitioners today who represent an interdisciplinary set of perspectives. And our collective job is to create a space that is respectful and open. And we ask for your help in creating and maintaining this space. We would like to give a huge thanks to our steering committee. This amazing group of people um, really helped us to define the questions for the summit and to create a vision for the structure and makeup that you see. We thank Ron Thom, Megan Detier, Jennifer Griffiths, Devin Smith, Chris Ellings, Simone Desroches, Doris Small, Sydney Fishman, Don Pucci, and Paul Cherigino. Thank you all so much. I would also like to uh, introduce our planning team. Uh, we are here today thanks to the hard work of this group. And we uh, are all here behind the scenes making sure everything runs, smooth, runs smoothly. We've got Lindsay Desmal, Jenna Jewett, Darren Williams, Hannah Faulkner, myself, David Trimbach, Jay Krenitz, and Jason Toft. So, uh, so just to orient you to where we are with respect to the entire summit, um, two weeks ago, we had our beach session. Last week, we had Delta our Delta session. And then today is day one of our embayment session. And so our summit speakers um, represent uh, um, a variety of organizations. We've got 78 individuals um, from, from over 50 organizations that are state, local, regional, federal, tribal, 
nonprofit, private and, and academic. And I just feel so humbled and inspired by the expertise, perspectives and knowledge encompassed by these amazing speakers. And I encourage everyone to browse the program and to read their full biographies. So these speakers were individually invited to reflect contributions from natural scientists, from restoration practitioners and planners, and from social scientists, including experts in diversity, equity, and inclusion to help us think about how we can better incorporate these principles into our restoration work. So how did we get here? Um, the idea for this summit uh, really started from conversations between the Puget Sound Partnerships, Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring's Nearshore Work Group and the Washington Department Fish and Wildlife's Estuary and Salmon Restoration Program. So um, me and the um, coordinator for the group, Jason Toff, talking and the program manager for ESRP conversations. And we this idea has been incubating for at least a couple of years. And we really thank um, everyone who encouraged us to pursue it along the way and also um, to piece them for funding to help make this happen. The foundation for the Estuary and Salmon Restoration Program is the Puget Sound Nearshore Ecosystem Restoration Project or PISNRP. And this is a partnership between the Army Corps of Engineers and DFW that created a 20 year science investigation and series of technical reports, including identifying the kinds of habitats and geomorphologies in Puget, in Puget Sound nearshore, the principles, for, um, philosophical principle, principles for nearshore restoration, and a um, historic change analysis and strategic recommendations for nearshore restoration and protection. This was a huge body of work that has laid the groundwork for the Estuary and Salmon Restoration Program and for the science that it continues to move forward. This has now moved into a new phase with a feasibility report and congressional approval for 12 projects. And the Estuary and Salmon Restoration Program was created along the way to start doing restoration according to the principles identified by the Pisner Project. And then of course, recently, uh, ESRP acquired Shore Friendly, which is all about um, reaching out to shoreline landowners um, and beach systems. And um, if you tuned into the beach uh, session, you will have heard, heard a bit more about that. So our underlying conceptual model for restoration recognizes the connection between habitat forming processes, the structure of the landscape that they form, and ecosystem function, whether it's birds, vegetation, invertebrates, et cetera. So, what do we mean when we say processes? Um, this, uh, what, what are the processes that we care about? This is a depiction of a functioning nearshore ecosystem with diverse interconnected habitats. And when we think about processes, we can ask what are the processes that maintain this physical landscape where we see river deltas, salt marshes, mudflats, beaches, kelp and eelgrass beds. Uh, we think about um, what, what are the processes maintaining this physical landscape? So we can think about sediment input, whether it's from river deltas or eroding bluffs, sediment transport, um, moving around the system once it's in the system, tidal flow is a really important habitat forming process, erosion of habitats, accretion, the flip side of erosion, channel migration and formation, freshwater input itself is a, a key uh, habitat forming process. My personal favorite, detritus import and export. So the generation and movement of decaying, decaying plant matter that is the basis for so many um, uh, near shore ecosystems, um, exchange of aquatic, aquatic organisms, and then of course, solar, solar incidence from the sun. So we think about these uh, uh, processes and then we can ask for restoration, what is the source of the impairment of the habitat forming process and try as much as possible to alleviate that source of impairment um, as part of our restoration actions, rather than say asking what kind of a habitat um, is needed for a particular species and then building that habitat. So just a, a simple model of what this might look like for tidal wetland restoration, where we have a restoration action of reintroducing tidal prism by removing a dike or a levee, and we expect to see a suite of restored processes, um, such as um, sediment transport, sediment supply, tidal flow, et cetera. And then we expect to see some kind of structural change on the landscape um, as a result of those processes, and then some kind of functional response um, 
uh, such as increase in habitat for animals or resilience to sea level rise. And this is a really simplified version of these models, but they, they help us to understand both what to expect when we do restoration and also how best to target our restoration actions. And it's these models that we asked the researchers speaking at the summit to take a look at and see whether their work helps to inform or change or add nuance to our conceptual understanding of these relationships. So we organized uh, the landscape by shore form, um, shaped by different processes. And this is another sort of key foundational principle from the Pisner project is uh, this sort of organizing by geomorphic shore form. And, um, and this pro the Pisner project sliced Puget Sound into, into sort of four key uh, shore forms, um, deltas, um, specifically the 16 largest rivers where they meet Puget Sound forming tidal wetlands coastal inlets, which are like little mini deltas, and there are many more of them around Puget Sound, um, barrier embayments, which are smaller embayments that have a sediment barrier in front of them. And collectively, we refer to these two as embayments, and then beach ecosystems. And really, generally, we can think of these as um, having a, perhaps an increasing reliance on sediment supply as we go from deltas to, deltas to beaches. And an increasing reliance on freshwater inputs as we move from, from beaches to deltas, just in a, in a really general sense. So we've organized this summit this way, but we absolutely recognize that not all projects or bodies of work fit well into one of these categories, particularly the social science and diversity, equity, and inclusion work, which may very well transcend these, defi these definitions. The Estuarine Salmon Restoration Program has two major components. 90% of our appropriation goes to process-based restoration and protection projects in Puget Sound, and 10% goes to scientific investigations that inform restoration. And many of the research projects um, that will be presented and um, featured at the summit are projects that this part of the program um, has supported. So with the guidance of our steering committee, we developed these broad objectives for the summit. Um, so first we wanted to synthesize the nearshore science um, in the last uh, restoration science in the last um, 10 years or so. We wanted to capture insights from restoration practice. We wanted to identify the most important science and management questions to guide future actions, update the PISMERP conceptual models uh, where appropriate, and to incorporate social science principle, principles, including diversity, equity, and inclusion into the way that we think about and um, do our restoration. So to do this, we posed different questions to each group uh, of speakers to help them guide their presentations. So we individually invited each speaker and we, and we posed them questions. For a natural scientist, we asked, what are the key implications of your research for planning or implementing process-based restoration? For you, what are the most important uncertainties to address with future restoration that will result in more effective restoration? And then lastly, how does your work inform, improve upon the Pisner conceptual models for restoration? For social scientists, we asked, what does your social science or field of area of expertise contribute or add value to planning or restoration? What are major social science gaps and needs that you observe or experience within your field or area? And what needs to be done in order for you and your research to be better integrated into practitioners or natural science researchers work. Uh, for restoration practitioners and planners, we asked, what have you learned through your experience with project development, design and implementation that informs the needs of future restoration? We really wanted to capture that. And then for you, what are the most important scientific uncertainties, whether they're natural science or social science that limit planning, designing, implementing or evaluating nearshore restoration. So these were, the, these were the questions that we asked each group of speakers. And then this is the lineup for today. And what you can see is that we've created an, an integrated speaker lineup where we have people from each discipline um, respectively speaking. And we really wanted to create an environment where everyone could listen to one another and um, maybe start to break down um, some of these um, silos if they exist. So there are a lot of different flavors of embayments. This is the focus of our work today. And um, these features were mapped by the Pisner project. And the way that they were mapped really illustrates the diversity of, of sort of what we mean when we say embayment. Um, so um, I'm just gonna sort of share that process with you to, to show the kind of diversity of, of uh, 
of this habitat. So one of the first um, sort of defining characteristics um, that was used to map them was whether there is a barrier or a spit. And if not, it was mapped as an co open coastal inlet. Um, and if yes, then the question was, is there a surface connection to the sound? If not, it was mapped as a closed lagoon and marsh. And if yes, the question was, is there freshwater input, uh, significant freshwater input? If no, it was mapped as a barrier lagoon. And if yes, it was mapped as a, as a barrier estuary. Um, and collectively, these three um, um, habitats with barriers are sometimes referred to um, collectively as barrier embayments. Um, and it's worth noting that this is just one approach uh, to, to characterizing and mapping these habitats. Um, this was uh, done by the Pisnert project using the best available sound-wide data at the time. Um, there have, of course, been many more detailed local efforts to map and characterize um, embayments um, since then, as well as a sound-wide mapping protocol that was recently developed in support of the Puget Sound Partnership's vital sign and Chinook common indicators. So, um, these embayment ecosystems um, are often comprised of tidal wetlands. And um, when we think about tidal wet wetland and habitat loss, um, we often think about the, the largest river deltas in Puget Sound uh, because of this, the sheer volume of habitat loss. But it's also really important to consider the loss and alteration of these smaller embayment systems, both in terms of the quality and quantity of the habitat that's been lost or altered, um, and also in, but also in terms with in terms, in terms of um, these habitats with respect to um, the, the location of these habitats um, from one another the di and distance from one another um, and, to, and distance and location in terms of the animals and plants that rely on them. Um, and we call this uh, consideration of distance and location a landscape perspective. Uh, these are highly productive ecosystems. They're often nursery habitats. They're disproportionately impacted by humans. They've um, experienced globally significant habitat loss and degradation. And of course, um, like many coastal habitats, they're threatened by sea level rise and coastal squeeze. This is just um, some data from the Puget Sound uh, Pisnart Project um, change analysis, just showing that um, these habitats have, have really um, been reduced in their historic, from their historic length and complexity. Um, about 50% of the historic length has been lost in embayments. And, um, and of course, there's a suite of kinds of degradation to the habitats that we see um, around Puget Sound, including tidal barriers, armoring, nearshore roads, fill, watershed impervious surfaces, nearshore impervious surfaces, and the railroad. So a lot, a lot of um, raw material to think about restoration and restoring processes. So what we're really trying to do with this summit is connect science and restoration. And so we can do this by learning, um, by looking at an ecosystem response to restoration, um, maybe developing tools to inform restoration. This, these then need to be communicated um, and then ultimately incorporated into restoration projects uh, and implemented on the ground. And we just want to point out that we really see this Nearshore Restoration Summit a synthesis as a, a key connector um, in this cycle, and we're, we're really excited about it. So what we ultimately want to do is bring together uh, restoration practitioners and scientists into the summit and to share what we've learned, the questions that we have, and chart a course for the next generation of restoration and, re restoration and research. Um, and we're doing this by creating a proceedings uh, from, from the summit where um, everyone will have, uh, have a, a chance to write down the contents of their talk and will create this durable roadmap um, for future restoration and research and, and then share that with the broader restoration community and anyone who's, whose work um, might be informed by this. And so with that, I would like to pass the mic over to our first speaker, and we'll have just a few minutes uh, to help this uh, transition and cross our fingers that we've gotten all of the technology issues um, over with for the day. And I'll say hello while I'm not screen sharing everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much for your patience with our, I, I really do think we jinxed it uh, with our technology issues. So we'll, we'll just knock on all the wood near us that, um, that that was it. And um, Kristen, we've got just a couple minutes. Um, we'll try to start right at one. Um, do you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen? Okay, Kristen, why don't we go ahead and get, and get started? Um, our next speaker is Kristen Williamson, Williamson from, from the 
um, South Puget Sound Salmon Enhancement Group. And the title of Kristen's talk is Where Are the Fish? Articulating Natal and Non-Natal Fish Benefits to Justify Large Capital Investments in Estuary Restoration Projects. Take it away, Kristen. Right, thank you, Tish, and thanks for that great introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay, great, thanks. All right, well, thanks for um, also having the opportunity to share with you all here today. Um, so where are the fish? Um, that's probably a question we've all been asked or have certainly asked ourselves. And so wanting to try to unpack that a little bit and think about how we use that as social scientists, restoration scientists, and or restoration practitioners and natural scientists. Um, it's, oops. Not an easy question to answer. Um, the Salish Sea is a really big place and there's a lot of people working really hard to answer that question across the Salish Sea, but we can't have site specific information everywhere. Um, it's also, we have a complex network of freshwater uh, waterways that fish could be occupying at any particular time. And those connect to um, a also a complex network of both uh, large natal estuaries and smaller pocket estuaries or embayments that are scattered throughout and all the shorelines that connect them across the many miles uh, that make up the Salish Sea. Oops, excuse me. And furthermore, um, we, we are working in a very altered landscape and um, there's not access. We've cut off access or, or completely changed um, the landscape in some of our different estuaries and embayments. And so it's hard to understand how fish might use those altered shorelines. And we also need to recognize that um, the landscape does not look like the post-glacial landscape of the Puget Sound that our fish populations evolved over 11,000 years to adapt and occupy. And they may be using the, the fish strategies and life history strategies that um, may have used to be present here um, may have been maybe gone from the landscape as well. Sorry, let me hard pen. There we go. And furthermore, I think a lot of people that we're working with, our stakeholders and our public um, folks, when they think about fish and they think about fish habitat or salmon habitat, they think about this life stage. Um, and this life stage is more predictable and we have a long-term data set knowing where um, fish spawn and when they are there. And so we've been able to really think about how to protect and restore those landscapes in a little bit better way than we can have been able to think about how to restore habitat and landscapes for this life stage. This life stage is a little bit more complicated. They're harder to see with the eye. They, they live beneath the surface, sometimes in deeper water and sometimes in really complex habitat. But in order to bring those big populations of fish back to our watershed, we really need to be able to manage um, habitat restoration for this life stage as well and articulate its importance to the folks that we work with. So coming back to that question, where are the fish? Um, as a restoration community, we know that that life stage is important and we know somewhat of where, where and when they use different estuarine and restoration habitats, but we need to be able to tell that story in order to justify um, investments in the right place at the right time and the right scale as, as, um, as our population keeps growing and as um, habitat restoration becomes um, more and more complicated with larger scale um, projects coming online. So, this is gonna be a little bit, hopefully not repetitive, but reinforcing um, some of the talks that I heard in the Delta um, session of, with Lauren Brokaw. How do we articulate and translate the science to those folks that we're needing to work with on the ground to secure permission to do the restoration work that we need to do? So for my part um, um, on this presentation today, I'm gonna to take us into South Sound, that's where I work. Um, and I'm gonna think about or show you three different projects. Um, and how we are trying to synthesize the science, the near shore science that's available to us, but also bring it to some site specific um, thoughts and ideas about how fish can benefit from these particular projects in these locations between the Puyallup, and the Puyallup Delta and the shoreline that connects it to the Nisqually Estuary. Um, and funding is always scarce, right? So um, we're employing you know, kind of a range of methods from relatively low cost to a little bit higher cost investment to uh, kind of develop our site specific stories for fish benefits from these potential projects that are in various stages of design at this point. Planning and design, I should say. I'm gonna start with Chambers Bay, which is our furthest one south. Chambers Bay is a long kind of finger estuary embayment with a historic barrier spit at the mouth. And it used to at least have um, kind of higher slope forested bluffs surrounding it. 
is no stranger to uh, the effects of on our um, shorelines and landscapes, and it has it is uh, yeah it received a lot of development. And many of you on this call are probably very familiar with this site. It was one of those Pisner um, ten percent conceptual design projects. So for the focus of our project, where we are at right now, we are really looking at and trying to march towards preliminary design of removal of that existing dam working with um, the various different stakeholders that we need to and effective governments to in order to secure that permission and also secure the funding. Um, but the dam sits about 12 feet tall and it cuts off about an estimated 20 acres of what used to be the native um, est estuary here and certainly cuts off access to that still somewhat intact um, forested tidal wetland areas of the upper, upper head of the bay here. You can see it, it would have had the delta, but here's the Chambers Creek Delta forming behind that dam. So it's also, you know, in addition to impairing fish access and fish process, it's fish access, it's also impairing processes clearly. So again, trying to think of how we can develop some site specific fish utilization um, information to share with folks. We're using really a lot of existing data that's out there and, and taking advantage of a lot of work that so many talented folks have um, put into the Nisqually Delta and looking at fish utilization there. So this is a graphic from Hodgson et al. 2016. And this is uh, basically constructing migration pathways of fish coming from the north or other watersheds into South Sound and vice versa. And this is derived from coded wire tag data captured from um, fish at these locations in the, in the Nisqually Estuary and in the near shore. And Chambers Bay is here in near shore Cormorant Pass. Um, and so we can articulate this information using hatchery fish as an example to folks, but also trying to do a little bit of site specific and, and hopping on with those collaborators who are doing the science as a restoration practitioner, a lot making ourselves available to help with some of that sampling so that we can um, get that information. And here shows uh, two juvenile unmarked Chinook that we found inside Chambers Bay. And for those of you who don't know Chambers Bay, it does not have its own, it does not have a, a, a wild or unmarked Chinook population um, that use it. So we know those fish came in from outside to rear in Chambers Bay, at least what they have access to. And so taking this information has really helped us to help people to understand that this dam is important, the dam removal is important both for restoring Chambers Creek fish populations, but it also could be regionally significant for multiple Puget Sound fish populations for that rearing habitat. And then moving north to Titlo Lagoon in the Tacoma Narrows, this photo series really shows us how we have undervalued these uh, little estuarine Im embayments um, over time and how they have been kind of treated as nuisance and developed to their, to their um, uh, you know, kind of margins. And Titlow Lagoon, I should say, it's not, it's conventionally, it's called a lagoon, but it's actually, um, with the definitions that Tish just outlined, it actually has two unnamed creeks and a lot of, and a bunch of um, freshwater wetlands and as well as spring flow coming off the west slope of Tacoma. So it does have a fair amount of freshwater input into it. So we've been kind of working with Metro Parks through multiple master planning processes and steering committees and public committees to try to envision a future, uh, reimagine this landscape for Titla Lagoon that is actually a central um, piece of the park as an ecological amenity um, and not a um, sort of nuisance in the middle of the park. So really looking at a 96 foot span bridge underneath a railroad, reorganization of trails and areas around the park and hopefully really reconnecting this um, feature and making it a, a place for fish to grow and thrive. And we've been able to, with this information that we have make some progress to that, that Metro Parks is committed to the swimming pool being gone and we're really looking at removing a lot of these spill prisms um, in the park. So we used similar data that I just outlined um, from work in the Nisqually to again, reconstruct those pathways and say fish would be coming by Titlow Lagoon. We need to be able to manage for uh, this as a little a, a stopping off point where fish can and move and really um, uh, take advantage of different foraging and growth benefits moving along salinity gradients and temperature gradients and, and, and really connecting those trophic levels to, to increase the food web. And that's all good and well to talk to people about, but actually putting eyes on fish we've found has been really important for us at this location. So we did three simple methods, three snorkel surveys in May, June, and July of 2018 and found on the order of hundreds of fish of juvenile coho, 
um, Chinook, both marked and unmarked, and a, a few trout just in those direct observation snorkel surveys. And they were there in those numbers at every, every single survey. So it's just a snapshot of time, but it shows us that they're there with reliability, so we should really be um, providing them habitat. And we did not find them in the lagoon, but, or in the estuary behind this embayment or, or um, rock wall, but thinking about fish passage through this three foot culvert that needs to move an incredible amount of tidal flow in and out, it's, it's just, it creates this hydraulic problem. And these are sticklebacks actually, but they you literally, you know, showing, just showing people fish getting sucked into um, through this, this, this culvert with this hydraulic drop has also been really uh, helpful. Oh. Two minutes, Kristen, two minutes. And this is the fate of those fish that do get sucked into the um, embayment. This is their, this is their only way out. So thinking about velocities and making those calculations has been helpful, but actually showing people what that means. This, what does 10 feet per second in and out of the culvert mean for fish? And lastly, the Clear Creek area is on the lower, um, uh, lower Puyallup River. And this is a, a 18974 survey showing the complexity that has been lost from the Puyallup River. This is our project study area. And we know that 99.9% .9 of the tidal estuary is gone from the Puyallup River. But we're, we're working with a ton of collaborators to look at this spot on the lower Puyallup River that enters at River Mile 2.9, right at that saltwater wedge of the, of the, esh the wedge estuary. And looking at potential for restoring uh, some of that delta rearing function that is so lost from the Puyallup. So working with um, collaborators to figure out, can we acquire enough property? Can the county and others in Port of Tacoma working in this area acquire enough property where we, we could actually remove these floodgates that come through six by seven foot, 120 foot long culverts to restore that connectivity to this um, forested tidal wetland rearing habitat. So again, working with a ton of collaborators um, to actually try to build some site-specific science for how fish would utilize this area. So you do mark recapture studies, um, looking at salmon diets in inside using habitat inside and outside of this Clear Creek area, and trying to put some energetic potential to the landscape. Also thinking about how what is the tidal passage through these culverts, these 120 foot long, 100 or you know long dark tunnel. Why would fish, you know, can fish get in there? What size of fish can get in there? And what different um, uh, tidal elevations and velocities can they get in there? And what is their residence time? And so we have these pit arrays, um, passive-graded in integrated transponders or RFID tag technology where we're tagging you know, thousands of fish from throughout the watershed and see if we can track their movement and utilization into this area. And I know everyone on this call knows the importance of investing in these little guys. Not everybody does, and so we really need to be doing a better job of, or we all of us need to be putting that information together to manage for them too. And so if I have time, this little fry guy would love to help me answer questions. Um, awesome, Kristen, uh, great work. And I just uh, love those videos. Uh, <laughs> those are great. Uh, so yeah, we do have some time for questions and I think uh, David is going to be um, looking at the Q&A. So just go ahead and write them. If you're an attendee, write a question for Kristen in the Q&A or if you're a panelist, you can write it in the chat. All right, so let's see. We have a few questions in the chat. Uh, this is one from Lindsay. So uh, Kristen, what kind of camera did you use to capture underwater video? Yeah, those were all just with a like a GoPro 7, which is an older model GoPro that we just took with us. Awesome. Uh, Helen asks, uh, could you provide the reference that was listed in your chamber's base slide, something like Endicott or Ellicott? Thanks. Yep, yeah, I'll send that later. It's Hodgson et al. 2016. It's part of the Nisqually work. Um, so I will send that. If you want to, um, if there's a link to it, Kristen, you could put it in the chat. In the and, chat. Um, then we can kind of uh, feature it for later. Okay. Um, so I think we have time for uh, a little bit more questions, but Eric, if you want to go ahead and start um, sharing your screen. All right. So Stephanie asks, uh, where are those 120 foot long culverts? Will they remain in place post restoration? 
Yes, I mean, that's what we're hoping, no, right? That's why we're actually investing a fair amount in that project with so many people working together on that is that the 120 foot culverts are under River Road or Highway 167. So they're under a four lane highway with the center turning lane. Um, and it's an incredible investment to be able to bridge that um, mouth of that, uh, that, that system. And so the hope is that they will not. And, you know, we were going to look at a lot of fish benefit coming out of that project to justify those costs. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Kristen. And I will introduce our next speaker, Eric Beamer. Uh, from the Skagit River System Cooperative. And the title of Eric's talk is Non-Natal Estuary and Small Stream Rearing of Juvenile Chinook Salmon Associated with Inland Marine Waters of Northern Puget Sound. Take it away, Eric. Yeah, I just wanna make sure you can hear me. Is that good? Yep, you sound great. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Kristen. This is a good one to follow up here. So um, I just wanna say that this uh, slideshow is a synthesis of of uh, work that started in 2003 and most uh, recent part of the slideshow is probably 2016. A lot of people helped with it. I've listed the key sort of authors, um, co-authors um, in this. So what do, uh, making sure it advances, doesn't seem to want to. There we go. So I think everybody knows what we mean by non-natal, um, but just in case some people got on the call late. We're talking about fish that are living in these uh, nearshore um, habitats that didn't come from the fresh water that is associated with them. So um, in the case of Shunuk salmon, they're all coming from these large river systems um, into, in my case, the study area, the primary study areas that would be basin. So they're fish from the Skagit, Stillaguamish, the Snohomish rivers. So what do they look like? We're in the family of the barrier embayments, and that might be the last time I say embayment in this talk. I often say pocket estuary, but um, this is one, I just wanna point out a bunch of different components to the systems that we see. Um, so this one is dominated by a large lagoon, but it also has this little drown channel because there's a creek that goes into it. So we have a little drown channel estuary, um, and then there's accessible length to fish, um, including fry size fish in the creek. Um, and then there's even a little tide channel marsh area sort of associated with the inlet outlet of the system. So that's that's what one looks like. But we I kind of bend them into three categories, those that are dominated by impoundments, such as Kicket Lagoon, um, a site just north of Lone Tree Lagoon, or Arrowhead Marsh, which is a, um, a marsh dominated system. So you see most of the habitat, uh, the tidal habitat be marsh and tide channels or even these other systems where you have un unvegetated tidal flats, so um, low tide tear systems, all of them, um, whether they have fresh water in directly flowing into them or not, um, we see juvenile snook in them, at least in the Whidbey Basin. So um, those are that's what I'm talking about. And just one last visual, we're talking about Race Lagoon as being one of those systems of barrier embayment, um, but not Coronet Bay. That's a open coastal inlet, that's not what we're studying. That's not what I'm talking about. Although technically, I guess it's part of the embayment session. Um, so, okay. So who uses these habitats? We're talking about juvenile Chinook salmon. Um, we we'll start with the wild fish populations. Uh, hopefully you've seen this branching diagram before in some of the presentations earlier. Um, we're talking about the life history types that takes the branch of fry migration. So fish come out of the gravel and the river and they move downstream relatively quickly. They go, they don't set up at residence in the natal estuary for whatever reason. They may be kicked out because of density dependence or maybe there was a big flood and they got flushed out, whatever. They end up in the salt water, the nearshore environment. Um, and these are the fish that have the potential and, and to move into these um, nearshore, um, I call them here, refuge habitats. So the pocket estuaries or the, the um, small independent streams. They tend not to be um, hatchery fish because the hatchery fish more take the branch of, of natural par migrants. They they're stay artificially, albeit in fresh water um, and are released later. So they are, they're not um, basically getting out to the salt water at the time and size that we see fish use these um, non-natal um, refuge habitats. So that's what we're talking about. It's a fry migrants. The Whidbey Basin is a great place to sort of study that. Um, 
because there's lots of fry migrants coming from the three rivers. There's millions um, coming out of the Skagit River every year. Um, there's tens of thousands coming from the Stille. There's, there's up to several hundred thousand coming um, down the Snohomish River, albeit not all of them go into the near shore. Many thousands and millions uh, reside in the natal, large Natal River estuaries, but some of them end up out in the near shore environment. And those are the fish that we're, that we're talking about in this talk. And so um, just to sort of affirm that millions of fish in the Whidbey Basin from the Skagit, when we did origin work um, in 2008 and nine, uh, we see a lot of yellow, which is Skagit, um, high assignment probabilities for Skagit fish um, throughout the Whidbey Basin. Um, and so that's, the, that's sort of the signature of those fry migrants coming from the Skagit. So that's sort of the backdrop of who's living there. Now I'll just kind of go through several slides about um, what the fish are doing sort of in a, a natural history way in these non-natal habitats. So the top row is, the, is a timing curve for uh, lone tree actually right here compared to the Skagit estuary. And the units are zero to 8,000 fish per hectare um, of lagoon habitat or wetted tidal channel. Um, so fish are in these systems early in the year, pretty much mimicking the timing of the fish in the Natal River estuary um, and a much higher abundance numbers than adjacent nearshore or adjacent offshore for the same time of year. Although note that the Y scale on these bottom graphs are in declining order of magnitude from the top one. So high densities in these fish, in these uh, systems early in the year, mimicking the timing curve of Natal estuaries. So I have plotted the pocket estuaries with multiple pocket estuary and multiple small streams with all our sites in the um, Skagit River estuary and they're pretty much on top of each other um, from a timing curve standpoint. Um, they're, they're early in the late winter and persist through um, um, spring and decline in late spring and early, and early summer. Um, so densities are higher and mimic the natal estuaries. Um, from a growth and residence standpoint, we had some um, really good um, data from um, Otolis and also from Mark Recapture uh, and through genetics. And so we see in the pocket estuaries and small streams of uh, an average, a median growth rate of around a month, some fish being there a lot longer. And that's compared to the Natal River estuary where it um, tends to be shorter, um, um, the residence time, um, but the growth tends to be less in the pocket estuaries and small streams compared to the Natal River estuary. But when you do the math of the overall residence and, and growth rates, you see that sort of on average, these fish in the now Natal um, habitats are increasing their length by 20%, increasing their weight by 60%, and, um, and are a fit for um, making it to the transitioning to the marine habitats at the normal time, within that normal timing window of um, moving off to um, neuro, marine neuro habitats. One thing, and this is sort of the most recent work, this came out of some Bellingham Bay, Nooksack um, River studies where we looked at bioenergetics um, growth potential between um, natal river estuary, wetland habitats and pocket estuaries. And we saw that yes, the fish can get to the right size at the right time of year. But in, what was interesting is that one year uh, when the river, when it was really cold, the winter was cold, the river was cold, the actual better growth opportunity was in the pocket estuaries in that year, which is interesting because it sort of supports this idea of a portfolio of habitats being um, available for the life history types that are present in your system as being a good thing. So um, I thought that was an interesting nuance to that study. Um, movement within the systems and within the landscape um, the mar genetic mark recapture gave us a small data set to look at fish movements. Um, and we saw three patterns. We saw a pattern where fish moved within a system from the stream um, to the lagoon and vice versa. Um, we saw where fish moved from one pocket estuary stream system to another. And then we saw where fish moved from one system and we saw survivorship to um, someplace in the near shore. But this is pretty uh, useful information, albeit a small data set, but it documented, sort, supports a hypothesis that connectivity of these nearshore refuge habitats is important. Um, and so um, that, that could play into restoration planning where we have um, 
think about uh, sites that are strategic from a gap standpoint or adjacent to uh, a high use area or whatever, those sorts of things. Then lastly, I wanna just take the sort of two most important parts that explain seasonal fish density or Chinook density in pocket estuaries and put it together sort of in a, mo a simple model that has two sort of restoration applications at the landscape scale. So the first graph on the left is just the signal of the outmigration size. Um, so zero to six million outmigrants and then the, then the average seasonal density um, in pocket estuary, on our pocket estuary data set um, throughout the North Puget Sound. So it's a strong positive um, signal uh, statistically, but there's a lot of variation still, obviously. Some of that variation is explained by the distance from the river mouth, um, which is a negative. So the further away, the less likely you see even fish in some very distant sites, they're not even fish there. Um, so when you put that together and you, and you um, make predictions and sort of simplistically put the two things together, out migration, um, a low out migration, 1 million fry versus 5 million fry, and then, then what the predictions are based on distance from river um, source population, there's a, a theme that comes out. It's like, if you are in a landscape where you're currently not seeing um, non-natal use, that may be informative, but it's not the most informative thing to think about um, for restoration planning. You should be thinking about your recovered population. So if you're in a place where there's only a few thousand or a few tens of thousand um, fry migrants, so I'm plopping up some published data about how many fry migrants are coming from different places. We already know there's millions coming out of in the Whidbey Basin, so we've already pretty much verified that there's a need for this habitat, but other places may not have the current status of population. It does, it, what the real question for restoration is, are you planning to have these larger populations and will it include fry migrants? And if you do, then you probably wanna have a habitat opportunity for them. And that- Eric, one minute. Okay. And the last slide is the other, the, the spatial side of it. Um, and that is that not all places are equal. So the very distant places, regardless of whether you have millions of fish or not around, there's a misfit. The fish are already grown up by the time they get out there, they don't really need that habitat. It's the sites that are closest to the natal river system that are probably your most important. And that is it. I've shown the um, key references that were used in the synthesis of this and I don't know if there's time for questions. Yeah, great. Um, thanks so much, Eric. Uh, yes, we do have some time for questions. Great, so there is a question from Hugo. Uh, does water temperature play a role in the use by non-natal fish? Yeah, water temperature is certainly gonna play a role. It seems to be an on-off switch for mostly the off switch for the end of the season. These sites, um, it, these sites tend to warm up earlier and get too hot earlier. So that, that is a, a controlling factor. And also why, why that in that cold year, it was better to be in the more marine environment, the marine shallow environment warmed up earlier. And so bioenergetics were better um, early in the season in that kind of environment. It looks like Colin has a question, which was, which is, do you have a rough idea for how much the main sampling and analysis of this effort cost? Ah, uh, rough idea. Mm. I could probably figure it out. I don't have it off the top of my head because this was sort of a, this is a synthesis of research that started in 2003, where we just happened to find out that fish were using these embayment. Um, types of habitats, and then we had to sort of redesign our sampling to include stratification of them. But um, yeah, I, I could probably figure it out and maybe call, Colin can contact me by email and we could um, talk about it more. So if you have a question for Eric, you can write it in the chat, um, unless you are a panelist, you can, you, sorry. The Q&A, the Q&A is the best place for questions. It's much more organized that way, unless you're a panelist and then you need to use the chat. It's a really good, a good synthesis of that body of work. Okay, I can stop sharing. You want me to stop sharing then?
Uh, sure, that sounds great. Um, uh, if we, we can, Pat and Doris, you can start sharing yours. And um, if anyone has one final question for Eric, um, we can, I think we can do that. We have one, if that's okay, Tish, what do you think? Nope, I think we okay. need to, um, so Eric, if you don't <laughs> mind, uh, check it out in the chat and you can answer it in writing, but uh, we should move on to Doris Small and Pat Smith. Um, you guys wanna start, start sharing your screen? So our next speakers are Doris Small and Pat Smith from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the title of their talk is Juvenile Salmon Movement Related to the Tide Cycle a study to inform tidal fish passage in Puget Sound. And you just wanna do the, um, go up to display settings and do swap display and you should be good to go. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, good, okay. good recovery. Sorry about that, Take it Boy, away. right at the wrong time. So, um, so hi everybody. Um, so I, I'm Pat Smith and I'm on the left there and that's Doris Small on the right. Um, typically, and we're going to talk to you today about uh, juvenile salmon movement related to the tide cycle, and it's a study that we're working on to help get at um, fish passage issues in the intertidal. Typically, we share this converse, uh, this presentation. Um, I stick to the engineering side of it, and she does the biology side, but as we just witnessed with some of the technical difficulties, um, for this presentation, I'm gonna be doing the, the whole pres presentation, but fear not, Doris will be there for questions uh, later and is, is attending as you saw earlier. So. Um, so I'd also like to reach out and thank um, some of our primary partners on this. We've done a lot of work with the Nisqually Indian tribe and the Skokomish Indian tribes um, on this project. And uh, without them, you know, we wouldn't have some of the sites that we were able to select and, and work from. Um, and in addition to that, um, if, if you attended the first session of the Delta session, the first four speakers are, were either, are, have either been directly related to helping us on this project or at least talking about um, the specific areas where we've been doing this work. And so to get at some of the issue here, um, this is a primary example of, of an intertidal crossing structure. And if you were to look at it at this time, would you consider this a fish passage barrier? But if you were to come back to that same site six out, around six hours later, this would be the image that, that you would see. And so the complication here is that the tidal hydrology is, is bi-directional um, and the velocity drop depth and outfall drop at these structures vary significantly through the tide cycle. And so it makes it difficult to assess when these uh, crossings are barriers to salmon. If you, were the, if you were to be there at this point in time, you might say that, this, that fish could probably pass it. But if you were to look at this structure during, during this, um, what, that what you can see in this picture, uh, it would clearly be a barrier so the magnitude of the problem here is, is pretty significant. Um, this map shows uh, inventory crossings that are within currently known databases, the green dots. And the purple dots are from a GIS exercise that relates road stream crossings to near shore and elevation to get, a li get at a, a list of, of structures that, that could potentially be intertidal crossing barriers. And, with this, we have approximately 1,200 known points from, from the known barrier database and the, and the GIS exercise of structures that are within this intertidal range that may need corrective action. And so why are they important? Um, they are the lowest in the watershed. They impact um, a lot of the, in all anadromous fish species. So that it's basically the first thing that they come to as far as infrastructure. When, it, when they're trying to get back into their natal streams. Um, they have a high potential to impact the fish use um, being low in the, in the watershed for those reasons. And another really important thing that, to think about with these intertidal structures is that 
we're doing a lot of work on these now, whether it's legally required, whether it's due to failing infrastructure or, or, or restoration dollars coming in to put good projects on the ground. And because of that, we really need to get improved guidance on how we assess and design these structures. And so at Fish and Wildlife, we have a couple of documents that deal with technical guidance and um, as it, as it relates to road crossings. We have the barrier um, screening and assessment and prior, prioritization manual, and we have our water crossings designs manual. And um, the, uh, the main thing with both of these is neither of them really set out to address the intertidal area. They're based on riverine um, systems and, and they, they really, are limited in, in the information that they provide for, for addressing tidal crossings. The uh, assessment manual has a, sort of an addendum that's out now um, that helps a little bit. And our, the water crossing designs manual has an appendix that, that gets at ways to try to address intertidal crossings, but it's more of a do the best you can, put the biggest opening you can type of approach. And so what's really important to think about here when we talk about those guidance documents is that they're directed uh, at adult fish. And for, for the sake of our purposes at Fish and Wildlife, the weakest swimming adult fish that we consider in those regulations is the six inch trout, which is the larger fish you can see in this, in this image. But the, uh, the intertidal area consists of many, 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 and, and way outnumbering the number of adults that come back, smaller fish and juvenile fish that access and use these areas. And, and they do it through multiple tide cycles of their life. And so in addition to uh, the need for providing access for the fish, the other problem that comes up with, with intertidal road crossings is that we often bisect the habitat. And so in this picture, this is at Pitship Bay near, or Pitship near Squim Bay. Um, you can see how the road is bisecting that whole intertidal area. And, and the only real access is through the crossing structure right in the middle. So to, so to put that in perspective a little bit when it comes to different structure types, um, this image is from some modeling that we did at a certain site. And we're using it as, as sort of an example of how these different intertidal structures can affect um, just one, this, this is primarily just water level, which is a driver of a number of different things that could affect different habitats. But on the top left is, is, a, is a full inundation, uh, you know, reference reach type condition where you can see that, that the, the whole area becomes inundated and then as we work down to bridge, um, some bridges vary significantly. Some bridges, you know, full spanning bridges generally don't provide much attenuation in the, in the tidal elevation at all, but, but they can provide some. And so there's a broad range there, but as you move to the bridge, obviously sometimes these structures hydraulically just can't pass the volume of water that comes through it. And then you move down the list to open culvert and obviously that impact becomes more. And when you get to tidal muting structures and tide gate and flood gates, which are structures that are generally put in places to limit flooding because of some infrastructure concern, um, obviously we're severely attenuating the volume of water and the inundation levels that occur in those habitats. So, Something that we need to uh, consider here is um, how much is enough on these on these crossing sites. So they're they're often limited by budget. They're often limited by site constraints. Um, it's pretty clear that if we if we do um, full restoration on a site where we can clearly open it, then we probably don't need a whole lot of guidance other than get it out of there and open it up. Um, but when we get into those site constraints and other issues, that's when we have to start considering um, where we can find the sweet spot and, and with the restoration dollars. So because of this, we worked with Corey Green and Jason Hall at NOAA Fisheries to conduct a lit, a lit review on any information that was out there relating to how fish are using these intertidal areas and how they move. And, and basically the results of that were that, that the, um, 
there's not much out there. And so that led us to start asking some of these questions and wanting to continue to move forward and start this study. So what we're looking for here is to find out when fish are moving during the tide cycle, do they move with or against the tide? Are they fish, are they moving volitionally at all tide stages? And what the consequences would be for blockage or delay? And so we decided to, to implement a pit tag approach to our study where we would um, we put antennas out and we'd use pit tags within our fish. Now there's some problems with that um, in that the fish size is limited to essentially fish larger than 65 millimeters, which is is larger on the size. You know, we, we would love to have smaller pit tags, but as you can see in that image there, that pit tag, and it is to scale, is takes up a considerable amount of that fish's body. And, and another issue is that conductivity of salt water can create some issues with um, the detection of the antennas. So our, stu our study here um, in 2018 and 2019, we set up in the Nisqually estuary. Uh, we uh, tagged 496 and 492 fish uh, uh, in each year respectively. And in 2018, we saw 60 of those fish at the antenna site. In 2019, we saw 380 of those fish for a total of uh, nearly 2,200 detections over a period of three to four weeks. Had two minutes. Thank you. For the Nespali, or for the Skokomish site, we, um, the, same, the same applies where, where we, um, we tagged uh, 324 fish at one site, saw 142 of those individuals 1,600 times. Um, and for 2022, we tagged 696 fish. We saw 112 of them for a total of 1,021 detections. And so here's some, some of the data here. And what we're starting to see here is the detections were mostly in the range of you know, somewhere between one and five feet above the bed elevation, primarily, and, and there's, a, there's a significant band that's sitting there at about three feet above bed elevation. And if you look at the frequency distribution curve of that information, the, um, you, you can see that the primarily, primarily the detections were, or the largest numbers of detections were about nine to 10 elevation on the tide. Um, and with that, we started to look into some other factors as to when we can see patterns. And this graph is the tidal rate of change in feet per hour with the detections graphed over it. And this graph clearly shows that we seem to see the greatest number of fish being detected um, at the peaks and valleys of, at, at the highest rate of flood and the highest rate of ebb. Um, so this data from 2022 shows we were fortunate to spread our antennas out a little farther and we had more antennas. So um, we were able to look at larger scale movements. So the one to four movements and four to one. And so these are overlaid with tide. And as you can see, most of the one to four movements, which are upstream, were on the incoming tide. And most of the four to ones were on the outcoming tide. And if you overlay the individual movements on top of that, you can see that those are again occurring at sort of those peak tidal rates of exchange. Um, for next steps, we need to continue to evaluate criteria on fish movement um, and, and, get, and with our study results, um, evaluate habitat impairment impacts a little bit more and the model tidal hydraulics to look for uh, barrier or barriers impacts on fish behavior. All that to lead to development of technical guidance. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody. There's been a, a whole slug of people that have been helpful in this. And if there's time, we can take a few questions. That's great. Thanks so much, Pad. I think we've got time for one question. And um, uh, Pad, why don't you um, stop sharing? And Kathy, you can start sharing while we do uh, uh, a question for you. No one has placed any questions in either, but someone does have a hand raised. So um, Dave, Schreffler, if you could maybe put your question in the chat or a Q and A, that would be great. So I think we need to start. Um, go ahead and get started with the next question. But yes, please put the questions um, in the in the Q and A, and um, we can direct um, Pat and Doris to answer those um, in writing. 
Um, so our next speaker is Kathy Kettridge from Blue Coast Engineering. And the title of Kathy's talk is Using Hydrodynamic Modeling to Improve Embayment Restoration Options Without Breaking the Bank. Hi, thanks, Tesh. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Let's start with that obligatory question. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to just give a quick overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about um, today. So essentially what I do is uh, share some lessons learned from 20 years of my experience developing hydrodynamic models, specifically for estuary and embayment restoration projects. And I'm going to focus on um, some shortcuts, for lack of a better word, that, begin to, that can be taken uh, to provide accurate and useful information from these models without, as the title suggests, breaking the, the bank or the budget for the project. Primarily focusing on two things, to improve project performance ultimately once it's designed, and also to address stakeholder concerns. And I find that this tends to be where models really shine um, as part of these analyses. And also to build on uh, Pisnerp's conceptual engineering report. I was involved in that process and did a, the title um, hydraulics evaluation for 12 of those sites. There was no modeling done then, uh, primarily due to budget and also just data availability. But there have been some significant improvements in just the models themselves over almost 10 years since that report was published. And combined with the use of some of these shortcuts um, could offer an opportunity to do some modeling at the conceptual level for sites where there would be benefits to do so. So I'm going to focus more on methods as opposed to, to specific projects um, in this discussion. So first, um, Probably many of you are familiar, but very quickly, when I talk, what am I talking about when I talk about a hydrodynamic model? What does it do? Um, essentially, what it does, if you look at this image, you can see there's a grid on it. Essentially, puts a, a grid, a very fancy tic tac toe board, uh, over the site and assigns elevations to each of those squares or or triangles based on uh, topography of bathymetry, and then the model will calculate. Uh, water surface elevation, velocity, salinity, depending on the model used in each one of those cells based on a tide input that you give the model and some fresh water input. Uh, at a minimum, you can also, like I said, model salinity. So but the ones the, for the shortcuts I'm going to talk about in this talk, I'm specifically talking about models of tidal flow in and out of an embayment or an estuary as opposed to waves or some other uh, physical phenomenon. So um, first, uh, I want to talk about uh, what are some of the benefits to doing hydrodynamic modeling for restoration options. Um, first, um, you can verify that the tidal channel that you're proposing provides a natural tidal exchange and flow into and out of the embayment. You don't have any backwatering or sort of fire hose uh, effect. Um, it can provide predictions uh, of what the hydrodynamics are going to look like post restoration in the future. Um, you can identify areas of flooding where there might be draining and also where there might be higher low current velocities that might be concerning. And finally, again, I find this one of the most important parts of doing this work at the feasibility stage is it provides some visualization tools for stakeholders, the public and others um, to address concerns and just give some good visualization of what the site might look like um, after it's restored. There's many challenges to using models, of course. Uh, first one, um, and one of the ones um, that the shortcuts try to address primarily is that it's relatively high cost to develop, validate, and run uh, models depending on how they're set up. And that makes them sometimes prohibitively expensive to do as, as part of the feasibility work in particular. Also, um, large models take a long time to actually run, and sometimes that can impact the actual project schedule itself. Um, the output takes time and experience to interpret. Uh, and finally, uh, quantifying and communicating the uncertainties in the model results can be challenging. Uh, shortcuts I'm going to talk about primarily deal with uh, these first two, um, but do have some implications to the last two. Um, so I'm going to go over primarily three strategies. There are probably many others that some of you even here know about, but these are the three that I've found um, are most useful for addressing those challenges and developing models that can be used um, for lower budgets um, and get some really effective information out of them. Uh, so the first one is to begin with the end in mind. So focus on the primary questions you are trying to answer. 
Um, for most of these projects, there really is not a need to develop a, a Puget Sound wide model or what I would consider an academic level model where you're trying to perfectly replicate everything that's happening in the system. Um, you want to focus on what it is that you're concerned about for your particular project and build the model around that So sort of build it backwards. So I'm just going to give an example here of a focused model strategy. Um, what you see here is uh, two models of the same location. Uh, the project had two concerns. One was a concern to shellfish due to restoration and one was a concern for flooding. Um, and what we did in order to make this cost effective, even though it doesn't seem like it would be so, is we built two models. So the first one on the right here is a 3D model, hydrodynamic model that looks at salinity. And this model was focused primarily to look at shellfish impacts and was calibrated on salinity in those areas. And then we developed another model, which is the one here on the left, which was to look at flooding of adjacent properties. That's a 2D model. We didn't have to worry about the 3D model, which takes forever to run. We didn't have to calibrate it on salinity. Instead, we calibrated that on water surface elevation. We ended up with two models that ran very quickly and were accurate for the particular types of problems that they were set up to solve. And this is in contrast to trying to do one model that would do both, which would indeed be quite um, a large effort and very data intensive. A second strategy that um, I've used a lot is to reduce the size of the model domain or the area that is included in the model. Um, so I'm going to provide an example for that. So uh, this is an arrow pointing to a small embayment here, not that small, an embayment that uh, we were interested in modeling. And of course, it sits in you know a very large area uh, outside of Puget Sound itself. Um, so what we did, and we find this is true in most and barrier abatements in Puget Sound is their hydrodynamics, uh, the way water flows in and out and the velocities are primarily uh, uh, determined by uh, the opening itself, um, how big it is, um, what elevations it is. So if you can model that correctly and the inside of the embayment correctly, there really isn't a need to model large areas outside in Puget Sound to get good hydrodynamic results inside the embayment. So this is an example where we did um, good resolution inside the embayment area, including the very small tidal channel um, that was there. Um, but for the tide, we just um, only included a very small part of the adjacent Puget Sound, put a tidal boundary here based on a tide gauge from NOAA that we validated with a local water level meter for a finite amount of time. And we got very good results inside the embayment uh, when we validated the model. Uh, not only does this make it easier to set up, uh, it just also um, makes the model a lot faster to run uh, as opposed to making weeks. Some of these large models can take to run. It, it ran in a couple of hours. Um, and finally, uh, using site knowledge and experience uh, to just pre-select model scenarios that will be most impactful to the design. So that means that use your knowledge of how the site works and how hydrodynamics work and how fish use these systems uh, to not uh, to basically limit how many runs you have to do. So for instance, there's lots of things you might be concerned about how something might react to climate change, either increased rainfall or sea level rise, uh, where things might erode and cause concerns to people, where um, shellfish may be located uh, nearby and are there gonna be impacts to those either from increased sedimentation erosion, changes in salinity, are we going to flood adjacent properties? Um, and also, um, as lots of people have spoken about before me, can fish uh, get into and out of these systems? And are there some hydrodynamics being set up um, that might cause that to be an issue? Um, so I'm going to just show two very quick examples of that here, again, kind of at a high level. So uh, this was uh, the same site. Um, uh, that we modeled. Um, we looked at two different concerns. So first concern here on the left is um, the closed off bare embayment. This channel here is proposed. That doesn't exist right now. And one of the concerns was that um, at uh, low tides uh, or at any tide, uh, would this small stream in the back cause any significant erosion in this back area? And so instead of running a multitude of flows for the creek and a multitude of tides, uh, we realized that at a low tide, when most of this is dry and the creek is flowing at 
as a high, very high volume. That would be the worst case scenario for erosion. So that's the scenario we ran. We ran a hundred year flow, which is very high. Didn't see any erosion problems. And so realized we didn't have to run any lower flows um, to show that there were gonna be any erosion issues um, inside uh, the back end of this embayment. And then likewise over here, this was a, also an erosion concern, with, but this was based on shellfish impacts. So there's some shellfish beds out here, you can see in this outlined red area. And so again, we ran a very high creek flow that was probably conservatively high uh, and also ran minutes. a very negative tide. Thank you. Uh, am I unmuted again? You're great. Thanks so much. Okay, sorry. It, something muted me. It might be I did it or someone else did it. But anyhow, um, so uh, anyway, we were ran this at a very low tide with a very high flow. Again, focused on trying to see if there would be any erosion issues uh, near the shellfish beds, and we did find you know a localized issue uh, based on our conservative estimate. Um, and we ran one other one that was uh, slightly less conservative and found that that issue um, improved. So again, instead of running, um, you know, 20 different runs with various different conditions, just using knowledge and experience of yourself and the team uh, to target uh, which simulations you can do um, can definitely limit the amount of time and money spent on the modeling effort. Um, and with that, I can just take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kathy. Sure. Um, so we do have some time for questions. It's great timing. Um, so if you have a question for Kathy, you can write it in the, in the Q and A um, and, uh, and we will um, uh, answer it live. We've got some time for that. Or if you're a panelist, you can write it in the chat. So Jason has a question and Jason asks, um, I think in that erosion scenario, could you predict channeling? Yeah, how deep the channel will be, I assume is what's being asked. Um, the answer it, there is, uh, it depends, which isn't a very good answer. Um, there are um, models that do morphological change. Um, one of the ones I showed does have that option. Uh, the challenge with those is they, they were uh, validated in um, tanks, essentially. And so sometimes they don't actually provide uh, really good um, real world answers. So we do do channeling, but usually we do that using a geomorphic analysis. So um, often what I will do is I'll use the modeling information that I develop and then I will pass it on and work in concert with the geomorphologist like Jessica and I do this a lot, Jessica and I. Um, and she will use that information to inform a geomorphic analysis that will then answer the channeling question. We have another question from Daniel. What is your preferred, in parentheses, cheapest salinity model? Oh, <laughs> oh that's a very good question. Um, I like Delft 3D. Um, I will say probably most people who do modeling have their pet model. So I don't know if, if necessarily that's the best one. I don't want to get into the war of, of models. But um, I do like the Delft model. I find that it runs uh, quickly. Um, and I've also had really good luck with it doing a very good job predicting salinities, especially in this area. We haven't had too much trouble calibrating them. I think I've done about three of them in recent, recent times and, and all calibrated quite well. So, and it's also open source. Uh, so it's, uh, it's free, which doesn't hurt. There's one more from Emily. Uh, can the salinity model be applied to the entire estuarine deltas? Yes, um, I, I think you're asking, can, can the salinity be predicted going into the estuary itself? Um, I think, is that the question? If that's the question, the answer is, is yes. Um, if you do a, uh, you can do a 2D salinity model too. If it's very shallow, that works well. You don't have to necessarily do the 3D in a, in a more shallow situation. Um, but if it's a little deeper or you have a combination of shallow and deeper areas, you'll, you'll need, to, need the 3D model. But it will predict, the model predicts salinity um, all the way into the estuary. And it, basically in any cell that you put in that model grid, if you have that salinity function on, it will predict um, 
the, int the salinity intrusion, and it'll also predict the mixing zone. So where fresh water comes in and salt water is meeting, it'll predict that not only horizontally, but if you do have the 3D version on, it'll predict it vertically too. So it'll show you a vertical distribution. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> That's a great, Kathy, thank you so much. Um, oh. If you have additional questions for Kathy, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A and maybe Kathy can answer them uh, in writing as we go through our break and into the next um, session after the break. Okay, everybody, welcome back to part two of our session today. Our next speaker is Sarah Hearharts from the Mid Sound Fisheries Enhancement Group. And the title of Sarah's talk is Barrier Embayment Restoration Planning Two Examples from the West Sound. All right. Thanks, Tish. Thanks, everybody. Um, so, this afternoon, I'm going to tell you about two barrier embayment restoration projects that we're working on. Um, and both of them are, are in the planning and early design phases. And the work that I'm going to tell you about today has been funded by Salmon Recovery Funding Board grants and Kitsap County. Um, the design work has been done by Blue Coast Engineering and Julia Tadano, who's one of the attendees today, is our project manager for these projects. And um, both of the projects I'm going to be telling you about are located on the northern Kitsap Peninsula with point no point right on the northeastern tip and Rose Point, um, just a couple of miles south of that, about halfway between Point No Point and Kingston. And barrier embayments in this area have entirely been lost um, and they would provide important rearing habitats for juvenile Chinook salmon from the larger river basins, making their way out towards Admiralty Inlet and the Straits on their out migration journey. And the West Sound Nearshore Integration and Synthesis for Chinook Salmon Recovery, which was a report that came out in 2016, looked at 420 potential nearshore projects along the eastern shore of Kitsap County and identified Point No Point as the highest priority project and Rose Point as number 25 overall. So these are both relatively high priority projects for um, salmon recovery in, um, in the West Sound. And I just want to point out quickly that um, our projects share the same shore process unit or drift cell, which is shown in the figure on the left. And that drift cell is largely intact with sediment transport dominated from south to north. And these two projects aim to restore two of the three lost embayments along this stretch of shoreline. And they're also in proximity to a third lost barrier embayment restoration project um, located near Hansville on the North Shore that's currently um, being developed as well. And so we're going to start today at Rose Point, and this is an aerial image of the project area with um, the creosote bulkhead and remnant marsh cells on one property and the, a freshwater stream that crosses under a private road, private road on the other property that historically fed into the marsh. And so getting a closer look here, some of the key elements in our restoration planning are removal of this U-shaped creosote bulkhead, um, reconnecting that unnamed stream back into the marsh. Um, that property now, or that stream now, once it hits the bulkhead, it kind of runs along the edge of the bulkhead and out to the sound, um, but it does still support resident cutthroat trout and is also classified as a coho salmon stream. And um, there's a remnant marsh on one property that was that is separated by um, berms that were created before the bulkhead was installed. And so now there are two separated freshwater wetland cells that historically were part of the salt marsh here. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of an on the ground look at the site. Um, so the photo on the left, which I forgot to mention in my <laughs> first slide was from Rose Point. Um, that photo on the left is showing the creosote bulkhead um, looking north along the shore. And the photo on the right shows the stream snaking around the southern corner of the bulkhead before heading out to sea. And this is a view from, from Upland. Um, so the photo on the left is from higher up on the Kotsun property looking east out towards the wetlands and the sound. And those wetlands are bordered by that seawall on, um, on the seaward side and bisected by a berm that was once used as a road. 
Um, and the photo on the right shows kind of the landward edge um, of the bulkhead. And um, you can kind of contrast the berm on the northern property with the wetland to the south um, on the adjacent property. And that um, fresh water, remember, kind of flows, once it hits the bulkhead, flows along the bulkhead out towards the beach. And a little bit about the historic conditions that are informing our design. Um, so the historic T-sheet on the left shows the barrier embayment configuration that once existed at the site. And you'll note that there's an inner salt marsh and outer barrier beaches or sand spits. And the southern span sand spit overlaps the northern one with a tidal channel keeping the two separated. And the bulkhead currently sits about here. And, um, and there's that stream coming down from the uplands. And um, the stream alignment really hasn't changed much except where it hits the bulkhead. Um, and there's also a bridge um, crossing over the stream, which you can see in this 1977 aerial photo. So the, um, that, that's the photo on the right. And by 1977, um, a berm and some type of arm ring had been constructed to protect some cabins that, that once existed on the beach. Um, but the existing bulkhead was not actually constructed until 1985. And um, there's also a road, th that road bisecting the marsh that you can see um, in this 1977 aerial. And that road had been built at least by the 1950s. And so thinking about, um, the historical context of this shoreline, um, some of the conceptual design elements that we're working on are removing all of the coastal armoring, um, excavating a new tidal channel with the width and depth to be determined as we move through the next design phase, and creating really a self-sustaining barrier embayment. And I wanted to give a quick note about um, some project enablers that have made this, this a possibility. Um, so shore-friendly Kitsap and our WDFW area habitat biologist, Nam Su, played an early role in developing landowner relationships and support for restoration of this site, um, shifting the focus from bulkhead replacement to shoreline restoration. So originally, um, the property owner, Mr. Cotton, had approached Kitsap County looking for help with um, permitting a bulkhead replacement. And now, um, thanks to shore-friendly Kitsap and and others who took the time to talk with him about other options were looking at a, a shoreline restoration instead. And at this site, we have room to uh, restore the embayment. Um, there's the houses that are on this property are, are set very far back um, and there's no house on the property where the stream flows in. Um, and there's intact coastal processes to maintain the barrier embayment form once it's restored. Um, and understanding of the historic conditions. So pulling the T-sheet showed that this project was going to be more complex than a simple bulkhead removal and allowed us to apply for the appropriate funding for a larger restoration effort. And finally, we have support from our lead entity. So the lead entity is the local salmon recovery organizing body and for East Kitsap, that's the West Sound Partners for Ecosystem Recovery. So now we're gonna move on to point, no point. Um, so going back to my overview map, just to orient everyone as we switch back, this site is positioned right at the confluence of Central Puget Sound and Admiralty Inlet. And it's in an area where waters and aquatic life from Puget Sound, Hood Canal and the inlet can intermix. And in addition to its biological significance, this location is um, culturally and historically significant. The Sklalem and Suquamish tribes use this area for fishing, hunting, gathering of food and medicinal plants and other uses. And this is also the site where the Treaty of Point No Point was signed in 1855. And now um, Point No Point is a Kitsap County Park featuring beach access and an interior freshwater marsh that is an important bird area. And that freshwater marsh historically was um, salt marsh and Point No Point Road borders the marsh on the north side and accesses the parking lot for the park and the lighthouse. And this road was constructed around um, 1920 and is likely how 
the tidal connection to the north was lost, and we'll have more on that on the next slide. Um, and the historic lighthouse on the point was built in 1879, and we think diking of the marsh began by 1880. And there's a recreational trail that wraps around the point and runs along the eastern shore, and it crosses the tide gate. And that tide gate currently prevents tidal exchange and blocks fish passage. And the freshwater marsh is divided by a private road that accesses some homes up on the hill. And there's channels now in the marsh that were originally dug between the 1920 to 1950 to help with drainage. Um, and that main channel through the marsh was connected to the tide gate around 1950. And there's also a small freshwater stream that's not shown here that currently supports resident cutthroat trout and comes down off the hillside um, and enters into the marsh west of Hillview Lane. And so giving an aerial view looking, this is looking south, um, a couple of things I wanna point out here. One, you can see the road coming in from the west, the historic lighthouse on the point, um, the tide gate location along the eastern shore and the recreational trail there, um, the ditched main channel of freshwater flow in the marsh. And um, at point no point, the sediment transport is west to east along the northern shore and south to north along the eastern shore. And there that eastern minutes. shore, thank you. <laughs> that eastern shore is within the same drift cell as point no point. And um, sediment transport and dominant wind directions from both Puget Sound and Admiralty Inlet kind of converge on the point. And just a couple quick photos um, going clockwise. We have the freshwater marsh, which was historically salt marsh, the North Beach with the lighthouse. This is where the majority of infrastructure exists and it's the area of heaviest recreational use and is also known to be a culturally important area. And this is showing the Tidegate Inlet and the main ditch in the marsh. And um, that last photo was the East Beach showing the feeder bluffs to the South. So now we're moving on to his, the historic T-sheet overlay, showing that the site was once salt marsh enclosed by barrier spits and um, a tidal opening to the north that allowed for tidal exchange. And sediment transport on the north shore, remember, is predominantly west to east. And you'll note the configuration of the sand spits with the tidal channel. So the western spit kind of forms the outer barrier edge with an interior eastern spit. And you'll see on the next slide that we kept this configuration of the spits in relation to the drift direction, but we're proposing to flip the barrier embayment 90 degrees. And this is for a couple of reasons. One, infrastructure um, along the North Shore is a major constraint, but there is room and sediment transport to support opening tidal connectivity to the east where the tide gate is now. And um, this project is currently in the feasibility phase, but we've already consulted with tribal archeologists and learned that the area around the historic tidal channel and the North shore should not be disturbed because of the um, likelihood of finding cultural resources there, but that restoration to the East could be a good alternative. And so a couple design elements to point out here is that in our concept, we are proposing to remove the tide gate and replace it with an open tidal channel to the east, um, restore 32 acres of salt marsh, and um, restore hydrologic connectivity um, underneath Hillview Lane. So wrapping up here with just a couple of common themes from these two projects. Um, one is the um, importance from regional context identified by both the Pisnerp study and the West Sound Near Shore study. Um, and having support from our local entity for salmon recovery has strengthened our ability to secure funding for these projects. Um, we have supportive landowners, both for the private properties at Rose Point, as well as um, Kitsap County Parks and Public Works at Point No Point. In both cases, there's room to do this restoration within more constraints at Point No Point, but coastal processes um, support the altered alignment of the tidal channel. And um, understanding the historical shoreline context is important in planning out these projects um, and investing time early. So at Rose Point, it started with, um, with WDFW and Shore Friendly Kitsap, um, developing trust and the landowner relationships. 
And at point no point, we're still kind of actively in this phase, but we've been able to consider partner and landowner concerns in our planning early on and also building on earlier efforts by WDFW to restore the site. So with that, hopefully I left time for one question maybe. Great, thank you so much, sharing. Sarah. So um, why don't, uh, yes, uh, perfect. I think we do have time for a question and Jennifer and Althea, if you guys wanna start sharing your screen while we transition, that would be great. So if you have a question for Sarah, go ahead and put it in the Q&A and, a, and uh, we have time, I think, to answer one live and otherwise, um, hopefully Sarah can answer them in writing. Okay, so let's let's um, move on. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Our next speakers are Jennifer Arnold with Reciprocity Consulting and Althea Wilson of Northwest Indian College. And the title of their talk is Bridging Worldviews in the Salish Sea. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it is our pleasure to um, share with you a, a slightly different focus of a presentation than the ones previously, but we hope it complements. Um, I've been doing um, work with participatory action research and community engaged research for almost 20 years now. Um, and so I bring that with me for this presentation and Althea um, has a lifelong um, investment in indigenous knowledge coming from uh, the Lummi Nation. Um, and it is really our pleasure to be with you here today. One of the main messages of our presentation is that relationships matter and dialogue is really important. So it's a little bit ironic that we're presenting here in a short um, conference presentation. So please um, bear with us. And if you do have time, um, we'll try out the wonder uh, session at the end of the day. Are you ready to go, Althea? Yeah, I might have to turn my video off because of the internet service available, avail availability here. So thank you, Jennifer. Let's go. Um, so we wanted to start by saying we all come to our work with our own particular worldview, but as scientists, um, we don't often explicitly talk about this. Um, and yet this is a really important first step in um, bridging worldviews and encouraging, nurturing, more inclusive collaboration. And we just wanted to call out this USGS um, ongoing project partnering with the canoe journey and this photo on the cover of their report as that idea of really acknowledging those different worldviews and how they contribute um, to, the, to the knowledge, the, the grounding and the, the knowledge and work that springs from that. Um, so we wanna just highlight um, a, a couple different ways of thinking about worldview. Um, dominant scientific traditions really emphasize the objectivity of the researcher um, and this takes the form of an abstract reduction of systems into attributes and processes. Um, we're not saying that this um, we're not saying that this is a negative thing, but we just want to illuminate that this is part of the worldview. So there's definitely value in this. But how does that affect the opportunity for collaboration and and other ways of knowing, working across other ways of knowing? So this um, abstract way of thinking often then creates a blueprint for action based on hypotheses of cause and effect. Um, and I just borrowed one of the models from the Clancy 2009 report. Um, but there are you know, many of these conceptual models, and I know you all have been playing around with these in some of the discussion sessions as part of the summit. Um, and so this idea of you know, the worldview as being kind of a bird's eye view, looking down and objectively looking at um, all the people, all the players, all the processes. And even in social science, um, that this positivist view takes a detached view of human systems. So kind of separating or objectively saying, um, let's talk about people in the abstract sense, how to understand and influence people. Um, but this is very different from um, an indigenous knowledge worldview and other ways of knowing. So my background, um, I'm an interdisciplinary scientist, but I also come from um, a background focused on um, social constructivist work and critical um, perspectives where who you are and your relationships and connection to place are intrinsically linked to the legitimacy and value of knowledge. Um, and this contrasts a bit with the um, objectivist paradigm that I just shared. 
And so we want to say, you know, we can only fit a few highlights or a keyhole look into some of these um, issues in this presentation, but we're going to give it our best shot. <laughs> Althea? Well, I think more important too here, Jennifer, is the conceptualization of indigenous knowledge in science where, you know, uh, especially with the tribes, the uh, Pacific Northwest tribes and um, tribes of the Salish Sea and so many of the um, inner workings of co-management and working together, um, it is important, I feel that, um, all of the entities, you know, work together in um, truth and knowledge and value um, with one another. Um, you know, we had been talking before about, so for example, the uh, the Cook Aquaculture um, pin breaking uh, 2000, 2018 now, um, 2019, I apologize if I'm not getting that number correct. Um, and how Lummi had participated in um, getting on the way of getting those uh, those fish out of the Puget Sound and, and how they acted um, expediently to do that. And I feel that that's something that they really took on by nature as, uh, as fishermen or harvesters of the sea. And those things really um, play a great part in how the inner workings of indigenous knowledge um, affects and um, works with Western science in so many ways, Jennifer. And so the legitimacy um, here is how people are involved. It refers to that social context that as knowledge is produced, it is um, produced in that social context that holds it. Um, so. Um, the history of the fishermen um, in the example, um, you know, in the picture shown here, and then that validity that, you know, knowledge is produced in a way that's appropriate to your specific way of knowing. And so that can be very different coming from an indigenous worldview as opposed to a Western science worldview. But the idea of Native American science is um, creating um, kind of strength or the complements of those different systems. And so if our goal is to be more inclusive with science and restoration, we need to be more aware of how our worldview and way of doing science might eclipse other concepts of legitimacy and validity. Um, and recognizing that people from dominant groups and in positions of power are less aware of their own positionality and privilege while it can be painfully obvious to others. And you know, I'm being a little bit provocative here with um, the cartoon with this idea, you know, referencing the Black Lives Matter movement and the murder of George Floyd um, this past summer, that while um, some, some parts of our society, in this case, Black America is saying, I can't breathe, um, alluding to, you know, the, the white police officer's knee on, on George Floyd's neck, that that was painfully obvious that it was a systemic um, issue. And yet for, for white America or people in a privileged position, it can sometimes be hard to see that that's part of the system and instead say, well, it's just that situation. Um, so as people coming from a dominant group, it, it sometimes can be hard to see why, um, why our worldview matters, that sometimes we view that as that's just the norm or the way things are. And I think you know, to be provocative is to say that sometimes this worldview of being objective, or sometimes we use the word professional, it doesn't matter who I am, it's the science that speaks for itself. And part of our message here is it really does matter who you are and those relationships and how you're sensitive to the way um, the work that you do may come across to, to other groups, especially from those non-dominant um, perspectives. And so then, um, going back to this idea of conceptual models that you know they objectively describe the system but how objective is that really um, that a lot of times you know people designing the models you know come from a position of privilege to be able to kind of invest in the research and and or the design of restoration projects or whatever that is and to be sensitive to how that comes across to other folks um, and so when you know, people who are designing these models or these projects say we want to listen to you and add your ideas. 
Um, a lot of times, and I do a lot of work with community engagement as well, people say, well, we invited input, but the response was low. Um, and a lot of times in people's minds, they might have this idea that we create the models, we invite input, we update the models, we invite input, and then we implement them. But that really is grounded in the idea that your own worldview or your own kind of conceptualization of how the boxes fit with the arrows is fundamentally stable and going to stay in the way it should be. And you're just really asking for ideas around the edge. And again, just emphasizing that if you're coming from a dominant group and in a position of power, it can be hard to see how this very framing um, can, um, can feel very threatening or offensive. And that may be sometimes why people don't um, engage. It might not be because they don't have time or because the language is too technical. At a kind of fundamental level, it may feel like it's not inclusive of, of other ways of knowing. And so people from historically oppressed groups, they really wanna see, hear, and feel their interests and worldviews represented in research and restoration practice. Um, and you know, this first circle is kind of representing this traditional kind of research um, cycle. And typically, you know, people are asked to engage during the data collection, sometimes interpretation phase. Um, but the idea is if you're really going at this co-creation and co-management, um, you really want to spark this creative, you know, let's do something different. Let's reorient things to be more inclusive. And that's going to be kind of a creative force that's going to really kick you out of whatever that framing is. Um, and I just want to say we don't have a roadmap. We don't know what the alternative to the conceptual model would be. It will feel disruptive. It will feel messy and uncomfortable um, for people coming from dominant worldviews. Um, but that's really the kind of creative force of this inclusive collaboration that can transform systems. And if we're talking about transforming ecosystems, restoring salmon, sometimes we don't just need little nudges around the edge. We really need to transform and say, how can we, how can we get to the, to the bottom? And this also, you know, is also a cycle here. It looks a little cleaner, but this idea is we're not sure where it's gonna go, or even if all these arrows will go in the same circle, but the idea is how can we more broadly think about asking questions, seeking knowledge and putting knowledge to use? One minute, Jennifer. Oh, one minute. And so if you wanna see change, let it start with you. What are aspects of your identity and worldview that shape your work, that internal reflection? How can you create more space for discomfort, um, especially folks from a dominant worldview? Um, who do you want to include in your work and why is it significant? And then how can they be meaningfully involved? Um, and we just want to emphasize, you know, it really starts with that self-reflection, openness to other ideas, things you may not expect or don't know where to fit in the boxes. We're not talking about fitting people in boxes. We're kind of talking about exploding the boxes. Um, and so really listening for that and sitting with that discomfort, building your ability um, to flex and give yourself space and time that you don't have to answer or fix things um, and, and really re invest in relationship building early on. Althea, do you have any closing thoughts? Oh, you're on mute. I just wanna say this last picture is about uh, one of the canoe journeys that ended up um, in Olympia, where these canoes specifically are doing a water blessing ceremony. Each one of those tribes, those over 100 tribes, brought water from their own areas and they did a water blessing ceremony here at this landing. So that's a, a pretty important picture. Very beautiful. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm really emphasizing this work is about dialogue. So we did our best with just taking a short slice and sharing it with you in this format. Thank There's you both that. so much. Um, <laughs> I took my daughter to that um, canoe landing a couple of years ago. Um, and we have a couple minutes for questions. So please put them in the Q&A and um, we can answer them. And if, we, um, if there's anything that we don't get to, um, hopefully you two can answer them in writing. So um, please go ahead and uh, ask those questions. Great. So we have a question from Hugo um, and he asked, Jennifer, what do you think about the precautionary principle? Would that be an approach to consider? Interesting. So the precautionary principle is this idea, right? That 
um, in situations where, you know, with endangered species or you have something that's very valuable, you want to be precautionary. So you want to allow for um, very little risk. Um, so I'm not exactly thinking about how that fits into this exactly. In some cases, use of the precautionary principle can encourage us to do things Um, I guess to be, I see, so maybe precautionary principle in terms of forming relationships and going slowly, um, perhaps that's what the person's getting at. Um, in that case, uh, yes. So I think one of the things Althea and I were discussing a lot in presenting this is this idea of going slow and being intentional. So if that's the precautionary principle, you know, it's to be thinking out ahead of what impact might be and to go cautiously, if that's kind of what it's getting at. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, and H Hugo, if you wanna clarify in the Q and A uh, and maybe you guys can keep the conversation going that way, um, that would be great. Um, but right now, uh, yes, we need to move on to Jessica Cote, our next speaker. You wanna start sharing your screen? There you go, great. Okay, perfect. Um, we have Jessica Cote with Blue Coast Engineering, and the title of Jessica's talk is Criteria for Restoring Tidal Channel Geometry in Barrier Embayment Systems. Thanks, Tish. Um, <clears throat> so um, I just want to acknowledge before I get started. So this is a was an ESRP uh, pre-design or formerly called learning project. Um, so that's where most of the funding has come from over the last four years, um, but also the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, Coastal Restoration Program and then Schedule River Systems Cooperative has also um, been supporting this work. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll mention that Tracy Sanderson is my, my right hand in this project and um, I couldn't be doing this. I certainly didn't do this alone as many of these projects, but she's really, been one of the major contributors, but just um, I'll speak today in the, the interest of time. So um, I don't really need to walk through, I don't think the parts of the barrier and payments, I feel like we've we've been able to cover this, which is which is great. So it saves me a little bit of time. I'll just mention a couple of things. So we do have the barrier and payments, um, barrier estuaries have streams, lagoons do not. So that's the Pisnerpian language. Um, one thing to note is, you know, classically we talk about tidal deltas, both ebb on the outside and flood tidal deltas on the inside. Um, and really these systems are flood dominated. And so from a, a deposition standpoint or a sediment transport port standpoint, um, <clears throat> it's this interior on um, the flood tidal delta that really has the largest formation. Um, a lot of what we've we've learned and, uh, and observed through this project is this exterior is because it's an accretion shore form. Barrier spits are accretion shore forms. Um, they uh, they grow with time. They need um, sediment that gets deposited, and so it's not ebb tidal flushing um, that really causes this type of accretion. I'll also just mention as a highlight that one of the other important things we've learned through doing this work is that um, stream input, so watershed area, freshwater input to these systems does not really um, seem to be a driver in terms of tidal channels, the primary tidal channel out here. The streams really lose their energy very high up in the system. So it could be a sediment delivery, um, but it only affects really that, that upper portion of these systems. So we set out with the goal to improve the guidelines that were developed as part of the Pisner project um, for sizing primary tidal channels. So it was well recognized when they were put together, these were put together, that this information was developed based on data that was collected in San Francisco. That was what was available at the time. And then they tried to sort of scale these relationships to Puget Sound based on um, the difference in the tidal prism and the difference in geology. Um, but when they were applied to some of the early conceptual design projects, um, it was pretty quickly realized that they were coming up with tidal channels that were deeper and not, um, not as wide as 
we observe when we look at T-sheets, for example. So that was the goal. And some of the, the sort of big overarching questions um, of the, the research and the pre-design was, what is really the best predictor? So if we're going about looking for, to restore a system, um, how can we predict what those tidal channel dimensions are really going to be? So um, a lot of research focuses on marsh area, um, mostly because it's something that's fairly easy to measure and is thought to be a proxy for tidal prism. Um, I'll caveat that that term marsh area is something I've struggled with a little bit in this um, research because, you know, we think of marsh as being the vegetation. So maybe it's really embayment area is maybe a better term. We've not changed that terminology. We don't want to confuse things, but I just throw that out there as something that we've been thinking about and, and hits home for us. Um, tidal prism, so the volume of water flushing in and out of these systems. So it's definitely related to marsh area, obviously, or aerial extent of the system. And then watershed area. So how does this play a role was one of the early questions that I've already given you a um, bit of a sneak peek about, about uh, that influence or maybe lack of influence um, on at least the, the primary tidal channel dimensions out here. Um, and then always thinking about fish. So we're always, you know, keeping in the back of our mind, this project was started really as a companion to the project that Doris and, and Pad were discussing in terms of the geomorphology. They spent a lot of time um, going out to these field sites with us um, and thinking about and observing um, the geomorphology around the tidal channels and how would fish get in and out of these and um, what kinds of other geomorphic features like little pools that develop inside um, that the, the fish can use. So Eric talked a lot about his research. So I just wanted to mention here that um, through the cooperation with them, they have uh, all these sites documented in the Whidbey Basin and um, Skagit River Systems Cooperative documented them in a very fine kind of scale in terms of habitat. So they collated these habitats to basically match the same kind of parameters that we were interested in. So marsh area, tidal prism, and then also they have already had the information on the tidal channel dimensions. And so we're able to develop a set of um, regression models for, for just the Whidbey Basin data um, as a starting point, which is was really amazing and a great way for us to learn about some of the things that we needed to think about and consider and some of the still open questions um, from that work. So Eric also talked a little bit about the three different um, predominant habitat types. Um, so impoundments, um, this is Ray Saloon, which, which he showed as well as a, a example of an impoundment. So clearly it, it's, it's one we spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, tide flats. So one of the interesting things about uh, these tide flats is they often do have this, this fringing marsh, but you know we're talking about more than 50% of the interior would be tide flat as opposed to marsh. And so essentially um, that area is submerged at mean high or higher water. Um, and one of the other things that I'll just mention is as we've gone through the sites, we started with all the PISNERP sites and then scaled things down. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our analysis, but um, there are definitely many more tide flat and impoundments than there are marsh. Um, marsh sites are very distinctive in that they have a much narrower configuration um, of these tidal channels and their tidal prisms are smaller if you considered you know the the marsh area uh, to be the very very large area that encompasses all of this woody debris and everything that wouldn't actually show up in our tidal prism our tidal prism and what's inundated mean higher high water at the site is really just the area um, that is uh, seaward of um, that wood, for example. Now, we don't, we don't know how much water is penetrating under that wood, so that could be a, a gap in our um, the way that we're analyzing this data. So our goal was to uh, be able to classify or parameterize um, at least 
three sites in each of the seven sub basins. Um, we chose to not really look at the San Juan Islands. There are very few barrier embayments up there because um, they're more pocket estuaries um, with the, the, the bedrock um, headlands. So, so that is uh, one missing piece of this, this data set and the analysis. Um, but we did want to hit all of the other basins. Um, the goal was also to basically provide a normal distribution representative of all sites in Puget Sound. So from the very small of a few acres up to like Daybob Bay, which I think is over a hundred and some odd acres. <clears throat> we also wanted to make sure that we were representing those three habitat um, types that I mentioned, which also presented a challenge. Um, but being that there maybe just aren't as many uh, marsh dominated sites. So we knew that it, to accomplish this, that we would need to do um, a lot of our work via desktop analysis with some field validation. And so um, in terms of marsh area, this is just showing you an example of a polygon, the GIS exercise. So we needed to make sure that the sites had really good LIDAR data. That was one of the first screening criteria, which meant that a lot of sites we just couldn't analyze um, if they didn't have LIDAR data available, um, basically when the tide was out. Um, we measured the tidal channel itself, so the, the width and then um, the average depth. Um, and then we also measured and analyzed for the mean water depth inside, so the, the mean depth basically at an elevation of mean higher, higher water. So if you flooded this, um, to mean higher, higher water, and you looked at the LIDAR, you could see how much water that this would hold, but we did it from an average perspective, so you didn't have to do a really detailed analysis, because the idea is we want these parameters to be things that other people can provide to into the regression equations to be able to predict tidal channel geometry for restoration sites. And then the channel cross-section area I mentioned. Um, so, and we tested the theory about using mean higher high water as a datum in terms of flooding against uh, the two year return period water um, elevation, which is something that Laura Brophy uses if you've heard any her talk at all. Um, and the mean higher higher water was is a better correlator for the tidal hydraulics um, and really for sizing these channels. Jessica, one minute. Thanks. Um, so we also did field validation. So we went out and measured tidal prism. So that's again, something that's really approximated from the desktop analysis. So we wanted to make sure that we were accurately representing that. And we measured tidal prism at about 10 of our different sites. So this is a summary of the sites that we've been able to analyze from a desktop perspective, um, as well as from a full site. And then the green ones are, we've done a desktop and then we've gone out with GPS to measure the tidal channels themselves. And we have a new set of, um, of regression models, which will be coming out this year as we wrap up this data, um, this project. And I'm just gonna mention a few other things that really um, have come up through this. We know that wind wave energy and sediment supply is really um, our, our key factors in terms of determining the geometry, the barrier spits, the configuration of these systems. Um, we're trying to prioritize them using some beach strategies data in our models, but that's we're still working on that. Um, we know that shoreline orientation is probably also important. And then the elevation of the interior seems to be correlated to whether these are marsh impoundments or uh, um, tide flats. And then lastly, I'll just mention that we've come up with a be able, to, be able to look at three, oops, sorry, three different sort of engineering kind of parameters. So channel foul lag elevation, channel slope and barrier spit configuration to inform future restoration. And thanks to all the folks that have helped us with this. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. I think we've got time for a couple of questions. If anyone wants to put them uh, in the Q&A or the chat, if you're a panelist. We do have one question from Daniel. Um, how was, uh, I'm a social scientist, so I don't know what this means, MHHW calculated, local gauge, nearby, other? All of the above. Um, so in some cases, we actually deployed tide gauges. Um, 
while we were out there. Um, we've been actually working on that, on establishing what is mean higher high water um, and what are the differences from South Sound to Puget Sound, because there is a lot of variability um, in the mean higher high water. So sometimes we're using long term gauges that we are, you know, have then transformed locally to the site. Um, but it's something we spend a lot of time thinking about and, and analyzing. And um, so, so we've We've done it in a variety of ways. And um, I actually cannot tell you right now exactly which one we landed on in the models. Um, I, I would have to um, go back and, and look at it, but yeah. All right, thank you so much, Jessica. If anyone has a lingering question for her, um, please write it into the Q&A and, &A and um, can maybe continue the conversation that way. And our last speaker for the afternoon is Jeff Gakel with the Washington Department of Natural Resources. And the title of Jeff's talk is Seagrass Restoration, Some Success with Challenges Ahead. And Jeff, if you're speaking, we, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm perfect. I was muted. There you can go, you hear me no now? worries. Yep, yep, we can hear you now. Sorry about that. And I do have video, but I guess I can't start it. So, all right. Well, thanks for the introduction, Tish, and hello, everyone. I'm with the Washington State Department of Natural Resources, and we, um, we are the state steward for eelgrass and conduct eelgrass monitoring and restoration. Today, I'm going to present to you some work of our restoration efforts throughout Greater Puget Sound with a special focus on objectives of the Near Shore Restoration Summit. Throughout Greater Puget Sound, eelgrass is generally stable, but there are areas where there has been losses, such as the embayments. These are ecologically important areas that support diverse ecosystems, important fisheries, and are a priority for eelgrass restoration. I just advanced, but it didn't go. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. So seagrass restoration is hard. And although there have been great advancements in techniques, there are areas that continue, still continue to fail. This map of Greater Puget Sound summarizes the 27 locations where we've conducted eelgrass restoration throughout Puget Sound. The green dots indicate areas where there's been successes, the red dots areas with failed transplants, and the white dots areas with mixed results. The full amount of the effort is approximately 142 test plots, 24 large scale uh, transplants, and about 375,000 eelgrass shoots transplanted throughout the sound. One of the most successful areas where we've transplanted eelgrass is Joema Beach State Park in the southern part of Key Peninsula in South Puget Sound. At one plot in this location, we've had a five-fold increase in area transplanted and approximately a 30-fold increase in eelgrass shoots transplanted here. However, there are still areas within Puget Sound that continue to fail. Again, here's the map of our 27 general areas where we've conducted transplants throughout the Sound. As you can see, there are several red dots on this map, and many of these are large shallow embayments where seagrass has historically grown, but has not recovered with our transplant efforts. For the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna focus on the three embayments, Westcott Bay, Port Gamble Bay, and Quartermaster Harbor. Both eelgrass and herring spawn have declined in these three embayments over time. So starting with Westcott Bay in the San Juan Islands, our submerged vegetation monitoring program has uh, assessed or estimated there was approximately 18 hectares of eelgrass in Westcott Bay in 2000 and 2001. The, whoops, I just went somewhere. Okay, the, uh, the presence of eelgrass around the perimeter of this embayment was also supported by other studies around the same time frame. In 2003, eelgrass declined in this embayment. And this map now shows the results of our 2019 assessment using from the submerged vegetation monitoring program. As you can see, 
all the eelgrass in the head of the bay is gone. And the only remnant populations are near Bell Point and across the bay from Bell Point. Subsequently, during the same time frame, WDFW um, observed a significant decline in the herring stock in this region. We've since attempted to transplant eelgrass in Westcott Bay. This started back in 2007. We, we conducted another transplant in 2013, again in 2017, and then most recently in 2020. The two dots across from Bell Point are from 2017, where there's still some remnant plants from our transplant effort. And then just most recently, north of Bell Point, that green circle is our latest transplant effort from 2020. Moving on to Port Gamble Bay. Here is a map of Port Gamble Bay, which is located in the northeast corner of Kitsap Peninsula. The data that's shown here are the data from WFW's herring spawn surveys from 1973 to 1978. The green circles indicate the habitat or substrate type that was pulled up with the rake surveys. And in this case, it's eelgrass. The pink dots indicate that eelgrass was not recovered during the rake surveys. What's important to notice in this image is that eelgrass grew or was found around the whole perimeter of Port Gamble Bay. If we move more recently to 2008 to 2012 timeframe, we find that the big difference is that eelgrass was not observed as much in the southern extent of this, embay, of this embayment but it still grows in the northern part of the embayment, closer to the greater water flushing. In 2014 and 2015, we conducted eelgrass transplant effort down in the southern part of this bay, and all of these efforts failed. So now we're moving down into south, Puget, south central Puget Sound to Quartermaster Harbor. Quartermaster Harbor is across from Commencement Bay and tucked in between Vashon and Maury Islands. Again, I'm showing you data from 1981 to 1985 of the WDFW herring spawn survey data. Green circles indicate the rake surveys pulled up eelgrass, whereas the pink circles indicated eelgrass was not found. The difference between the image on the left and the image on the right, or at least the data, is that you'll notice in the upper reaches of Quartermaster Harbor, there's quite a, a bit less eelgrass observed in the rake surveys than previously. If we zoom into this, in, into this northern part of this embayment, we see from data from DNR Submerged Vegetation Monitoring Program that from 2004 to 2008, this supports the data that was observed from WFW's 2008 to 2012 data set where the last remaining population of eelgrass in Quartermaster Harbor was up near Portage. Moving ahead to 2017, we find that this remnant population disappeared and now it's only down closer to the southern part of this northern reaches of Quartermaster Harbor. In 2018, we went in and conducted a number of test transplants throughout Quartermaster Harbor where the eelgrass previously grew. And as you can see, many of these failed. And the one site that did moderately well is down near the mouth of the upper reaches of Quartermaster Harbor. And it was in close proximity to existing eelgrass bed. So there are some commonalities in all three of these embayments. Westcott Bay, Port Gamble Bay, and Quartermaster Harbor have experienced many different human uses over time. Yet eelgrass has declined at the heads of each of these embayments in areas of low flushing and longer residence time. Whether it was a single disturbance or a combination of multiple factors, recovery from the new stable state to previous conditions has not occurred. In literature, this is often described following, using the following conceptual diagram. Here, a pressure impacted the system and caused the phase shift to a different community. Machnes and others who produced this figure um, identified it as a new negative feedback loop where conditions um, create habitat degradation and a loss of ecosystem function. 
from their study in this new state, eelgrass was not supported. Are we in this phase within Westcott Bay, Port Gamble Bay, and Quartermaster Harbor? If this is the case, it will be really hard to revegetate these three embayments. Just replanting may not be enough. The conceptual model by Clancy illustrates the positive effects of revegetation on the ecosystem. However, to revegetate eelgrass in these embayments and other embayments in Puget Sound where we've observed losses, we may have to improve some environmental condition before restoration can be successful. It may need be that we may need to address the sediment quality, the hydraulic circulation, and the water quality prior to making sure revegetation works in these systems. With that in mind, I can't help but think of the Killisett Harbor Project, an excellent example of the process-based restoration with the objectives of restoring hydrology, sediment quality, and water quality. It'll be interesting to observe and track the changes in eelgrass and other organisms in this system as the restoration progresses. So in summary, embayments represent one of the more value, vulnerable habitats in greater Puget Sound. Eelgrass declines in these locations can be seen as the canaries in the coal mine. Replanting in these systems may not be enough though. We may have to focus on a larger re response or restoration to improve water quality, sediment quality, and hydrology prior Two to minutes, getting- Jeff. Thank you. Prior to getting plants to restore effectively and successfully. So I wanna end the talk with an open question. How can our community further consider stressors that affect the critical components of these systems? And with that, I can take questions. Thank you. Awesome, Jeff, thank you so much. Yep. Um, we have time for questions uh, and um, please put them in the Q&A. Um, David, are you seeing some? Yep, there are a few. So Great. Uh, Jenna asks, uh, let's see, the English camp portion of West Scott Bay would be a good location for bi biocultural restoration collaboration with local tribes. Okay, that's just a suggestion. I'm gonna skip to the next question. So uh, let's see, a lot are coming in. Do you have water quality information for these embayment heads? There is some existing water quality information. I don't know about the current um, data set though. Um, Emily asks, do we have the environmental data sets in hand to assess where we are on that state change model by uh, Moxness et al? Ask the question again, I'm sorry. Oh, it just dis. Oh wait, oh. there it is, okay, I see. Do we have the environmental data sets in, uh, in hand to assess where we are on that state change model by Moxness et al? I'm, I'm not sure we have all of the information available at this point. We do know that eelgrass is missing. We know there's been a state change and we know a new system present. Some places there's a buildup of macroalgae and Machnus identified in their system that there was a, a lot of macroalgae, but um, I think it's, it's highly variable within each of the embayments and that would be something good to acquire, but it would take a lot of effort. Um, Renee asks, what about planting deep, uh, below depth of sediment resuspension? Also uh, an analog for sea level rise. One of the challenges with planting deep in all of these embayments is the limited light availability. And that's something we're tracking currently in some of the embayments and other restoration sites throughout Puget Sound. Let's see. I think there was a one question within, okay, that was already asked. So um, Simone asks, I'm wondering where the transplanted eelgrass is from and whether transplant failure could have to do with a mismatch between the eelgrass in the donor and recipient locations. Um, lots of work shows local adaptation. Uh, and different species of eelgrass might consider characteristics of the eelgrass itself and not just the transplant environment? No, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And we have explored multiple donor sites at different transplant locations 
and most recently in Westcott Bay, I think we used um, four or five different donor sources from around the sound. Um, Steve asks, uh, how might water temps play a role particularly over sequential years in embayment uh, suitability to support eel grass? Yeah, so that, that also is a good question. Water temperature, we're, we're, we track water temperature. And one of the things we've identified in some of these embayments is that the shallow edge of the beds are being impacted the most, mm -hmm. which could, could be not necessarily just water temperature, but exposure to air and extreme low tides and higher air temperatures during those extreme low tides. But we are looking at water temperature and that comes down to the flushing of those embayments. If we can improve the flushing rates of those embayments, it will improve water quality and likely lower the water temperatures to better support eelgrass during stressful periods. Do we have time for another question? What do you think, Tish? Oh, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> you have many questions here. Um, let's Short see. talk. But let, let's do one more and then uh, let's encourage everyone to go to the Wonder Lounge. <laughs> so the, here's a question from Robert. Have you observed noticeable differences in eelgrass density and pH levels? What we've done, um, so not specific to density, but what we've looked at was how pH levels varied with age of transplants. And we've done that. I worked with that, worked on that project with Micah Horwith at the Joima Beach uh, State Park restoration site, where we monitored pH levels in different age transplants. And we found that the older the transplants, the better they were at abating higher pH or lower pHs water pH. So, um, and, and so one could assume that that would be related to higher shoot density too, because as eelgrass transplants mature, they tend to plateau at a natural density. And the older the transplant is, they would be maximized, maximizing their density level or their carrying capacity. Um, okay, there are a lot of, so I'll, I'll ask, Jeff, are you planning to go to the Wonder Lounge? Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Definitely. I would like to uh, use that as a, an encouragement to get people to go. And uh, let's, um, so for those of you who, uh, yeah, perfect, Lindsay, thank you. The, that's in the chat now. Um, and so for those of you who are who, who missed my explanation of it earlier, I'll just recap it really briefly. It's a, an, a, a, an online feature app thingy that we're using to try to encourage um, uh, informal uh, interactions between everyone. So it'll quick take a picture of you and then that will be your avatar. You move your avatar next to somebody, somebody else's and it will make um, a, a spontaneous video chat with that person or people who, who may push their avatars next to, to your little group. Um, so it's, it, it's trying to do something that is hard to do in a virtual space, which is foster interactions among people, uh, maybe facilitate new collaborations, getting to know each other more, and, and really trying to emulate sort of that, um, maybe the conference hall uh, or the or a, the hallway of a conference um, or, or sort of interactions that you have on the side. So um, come uh, uh, join us on this uh, ride and um, head over to the Wonder Lounge. We've got it, we'll have it open for half an hour and um, we will see everyone um, here tomorrow morning uh, at 9.30 for the resumption of this session. Thanks so much, everybody.